presentation, I would rather like to give you an overview of how the total uh, field developed over the years, where we are at the moment, and what are the challenges for the future. Um, open my presentation. So I'm going to talk about cardiovascular noise research, evidence, and challenges. In epidemiology, we have a few uh, principles on which we base our re reasoning, particularly with respect to causal associations. And first, uh, we need to have a hypothesis, is uh, to have an idea of a relationship between an exposure, in this case noise, and a, uh, an outcome. Next, we need to have a biological plausibility for, for such situation, a biological model how the noise could affect uh, the cardiovascular system in this respect. When we carry out studies, we want to see consistent results among studies, and uh, we also would like to see different results in different populations and using different methodologies because we don't want to repeat the same error again and again that wouldn't increase the credibility of our results. Exposure response relationships, a steady increase of the effect with increasing exposure is a good argument for causality, but it's not a necessity. It may very well be that we're dealing with threshold effects, either from a based on biological uh, reasons, but could also be due to limited precision in the data that we are collecting. And finally, the magnitude of the effect should be in a region that has some public health relevance. And if all this is fulfilled, then we can carry out a quantitative risk assessment and uh, also a evaluation of the costs of noise and so on. But this is not what I'm going to talk about. This is a different field. It's economic aspect. So let's start with the first um, aspect, the hypothesis and the biological plausibility for, of the effects that we are investigating. And when I started working in, in, in that office that I mentioned in the 80s, and I searched the literature, then I came along a very old uh, publication here by Lehman and Tam from 1956. Uh, and they reported about various exposure experiments where they exposed subjects for a couple of hours to different noise levels, different types of noises, pink noise, white noise, industrial noise, traffic noise, and so on. And they found very consistently increases in blood pressure, decreases in stroke volume, and uh, a reduction in, in peripheral blood flow, flow. And these results were quite reproducible in the same subjects, and also those response curves were found. In, in these times, many laboratories carried out such uh, experiments. A lot of work was done in Sweden, by the way. So I'm mentioning this old uh, data because when I showed, first showed up in, at an environmental epidemiological conference, the ISEE, in, in the 80s or the, or the 90s, uh, those people who mainly came from the air pollution business uh, were pretty surprised how, how can noise uh, affect the cardiovascular system. And, uh, they were not aware that noise research has been had been carried out for many, many years. Um, I would like to report about a few experiments that we carried out just to, to make this a bit more um, uh, visual. We exposed subjects for two, three hours uh, uh, to car racing noise. This is a very unpleasant noise, this wah type of sound. And the subjects during the exposure sessions had to carry out simple manual tasks. They were soldering electrical circuits. And the same persons were compared before the noise exposure, after noise exposure, and uh, during the noise exposure and right after, we could see an increase in, in the excretion of stress hormones in, in, in urine and increases in blood pressure. So this was this one example to support the hypothesis. Another experiment, by the way, this was interesting, this, this experiment, because during the noise session, uh, the subjects produced more of these electronic circuits, but the error rate was even higher, so the, 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 the output was less during the noise session, but this is, was a side effect. Work noise, 95 decibel, in a brewery, 
um, where, where, where the bottles were filled up. This is terrible noise from the rattling of the, bo the bottles. Subjects had been working there for many, many years, and we kept them working one day with ear protection and the other day without. On days without ear protection, again, uh, increases in stress hormones and quite large increase in systolic blood pressure here of 6.5 6, uh, 6 millimeters. Jet fighter noise is a very frightening noise because it has a high maximum noise level and the level increase is very steep. We see similar effects, increases in blood pressure and we measure cortisol in blood because it's a quick reaction then measuring it in, in urine. Also increase in, in cortisol levels here was, were found. And finally an experiment which comes closer to what we are probably most interested here is this traffic noise. During an advanced training session, policemen, uh, they, we um, exposed them to road traffic noise via loudspeaker in the lecture room of 60 dBA, which really interfered with, with the speech of the teacher. So the, uh, the policemen had to, to concentrate more to listen to, to, to the speaker. And this was an additional stress, and as we can see here, Again, blood pressure increased and stress hormone no adrenaline levels. So when we take all these experimental studies together where we were looking at short-term effects of noise, we can, could see that a uh, typical reaction where an increase in muscle tension, the vasoconstriction of peripheral blood vessels, which means a, 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 a reduction in blood flow, uh, flow Stress hormones may increase blood pressure, typical reaction of such experiments. And we have an explanation for this. This is a general stress syndrome, which is characterized by flight fight and defeat reaction, which means an activation of the autonomous nervous system and the endocrine system. So this is our rationale on which we base our reasoning in, when we talk about cardiovascular effects of noise. And I should also mention that another pathway is sleep disturbance. And during normal sleep, we know that uh, um, we sleep, uh, there are different sleep stages which we go through. There is a certain pattern and uh, in, in noise disturbed nights, this pattern is disturbed. The amount of deep sleep is reduced and the amount of REM sleep, which sleep researchers both consider important for health. I come back to sleep disturbance later because this is a particular pathway which we have in mind. And very is, interestingly, um, the threshold level for a maximum noise level at the sleeper's ear is very low. Uh, research carried out in a laboratory with EEG measurements on the, on the head has shown that even at maximum noise levels exceeding 33 dBA, the probability of an arousal of the uh, autonomous nervous system increases. So we have this in mind as well. So what have we learned from all these experimental noise studies? And one most important uh, thing is this, for, with noise we cannot apply the toxicological concept. Decibels be, do not behave like micrograms per cubic meter. And uh, to make this plastic, it may very well be that uh, a person working in an environment where the noise level is 80 dB reacts less during work than to 65 dB in the, at home when he wants to relax or even less than when being disturbed by sound levels of 40 dB during the night. This has consequences, because sometimes people that are not from the noise business, they should suggest, well, why don't you fit the, the subjects with the noise dose meters, assess their 24-hour noise exposure and relate this to health. This wouldn't work, for the, those reasons that I have been explaining before. And the reason for this is, I mentioned already, is that the adverse health effects occur in particular when the noise interferes with activities of the individual. And such activities could be communication, concentration, relaxation, and sleep. The situational context is important when subjects are exposed to noise. 
And for us researchers, this has an advantage. We are sometimes criticized for where you re when we relate the outdoor noise exposure to health effects, the outdoor noise exposure at home to health effects. And then people say, well, um, most people go to work during daytime, they're not exposed. This is not important because the adverse effects of noise uh, appear when the noise disturbs with, with activities that when we don't want the noise. So the few hours in the evening when the manager comes home from work may cause more stress than uh, housekeeping all over the day at home. Habituation ad adaption. Um, we have seen from, from this uh, work noise experiment that sub even subjects that have been working for many, many years in a noisy uh, 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 environment show stress reaction when we put them in the laboratory and expose them to noise. So there is at least not full adaption or habituation to the noise situation. And from sleep research we know that even subjects that report in the morning after they had been exposed to aircraft overflights when they report they were not disturbed by the noise, they still showed reaction in the EEG and the, in, the, in the electric encephalogram and they had showed vegetative reaction, blood pressure increases and heart rate responses. Also we have to take into, consider into consideration the noise characteristics. Noise is not noise. Noise sources differ with respect to the maximum sound level to the noise level, rise time, the time course, road traffic noise, for example, is relatively continuous on busy streets, while aircraft noise is characterized by single events of which, with much higher noise levels. The frequency spectrum is of important, the tonality and the informational content of the sound. So this calls for source-specific exposure response curves. And we know from annoyance research that the annoyance reaction differ quite a bit with respect to different uh, sounds. For example, aircraft noise at the same average noise level is more annoying than railway noise, and, and uh, wind turbine noise is even more annoying. So in principle, we have to consider similar exposure response curves for, for cardiovascular or vegetative effects as well. Okay, I finish up here with short-term experiments, and now we move to the long-term experiments, uh, 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 long-term effects of noise. We learned that the general stress model is our rational, and of course it affects the whole body. In principle, the gastrointestinal, the cardiovascular system, the respiratory system, the immune system, all might be affected by the noise stress. However, uh, in, in noise research, we concentrated on the cardiovascular effects and we developed this uh, simplified reaction model which distinguishes between the two pathways. This is uh, the conscious pathway, you, we may say the annoyance, the emotional response to, to the noise causes stress reactions, activation of the autonomous nervous system and the endocrine system, which then affects classical, due to the metabolism, to classical risk factors of which we know that they uh, are related to cardiovascular, manifest cardiovascular diseases such as hypertension, arterial sclerosis, ischemic heart disease and stroke. And there is also the non-conscious pathway, which is very important during nighttime. Uh, try to explain that. Sleep disturbance is another um, pathway that leads to the same reaction. And, and this pathway works at even lower level then let's say the pathway during daytime in, in the wake subject in the wake subjects. In the beginning, we studied long-term effects in animals. The advantage is you can provoke the effect, uh, expose them to relatively high noise levels. You can expose them over their whole lifetime, and we did this in our laboratories. And we found, on a chronic basis, the same reactions which we which we've seen uh, before in, in the short-term experiments. Chron chron chronically elevated blood pressure, and uh, we killed the animals at the end and uh, analyzed, carried out histological analysis of the heart and, and found an uh, increase in connective tissue, which can be interpreted as an increased age of the heart. And subjects that were, uh, in this case, rats that were prone to develop high blood pressure, so called spontaneous uh, hypertensive. Rats, they even showed a stronger reaction. So this gives us an idea that uh, 
there are risk groups, subjects that have some genetic deposition might be at higher risk. We also have, um, don't look at all the data, just the red one, um, we may say so, some natural experiments in, in the occupational environment. And some colleagues from, from, from the Netherlands and the US, they carried out meta-analysis and found that within the range of 55 uh, to over 100 dBA at a workplace, an increase of 30% uh, in, in the prevalence of hypertension uh, per increase of the noise level by 10 dBA. Others did carry out uh, extreme group comparison and they found uh, well, double as high a risk for cardiovascular diseases such as high blood pressure and myocardial infarction in subjects exposed to, if we summarize it, to more than 95 dBA at the workplace. Uh, a 50 to 150 percent increase in risk. Well, and then the, the story, how about environmental noise, road traffic, aircraft, railway noise, all these things. I mentioned in the beginning, we want to see results from different type of studies, and, and we do have different uh, results from studies available, cross-sectional studies, so case control cohort studies. Cross-sectional studies, um, there are sometimes reservations made. Uh, it has to do with, with what comes first, the egg or the hen. Do subjects that suffer from heart attack uh, uh, have the heart attack because of the high blood pressure or is the high blood pressure a result of the heart attack? But I think with respect to noise, this, this problem is not that striking. Because um, it sounds reasonable that subjects that are exposed to high no noise levels develop high blood pressure. It's not that reasonable that subjects that suffer from cardiovascular effects move into noisy areas. Because they have uh, the health problem. So I, I think even the cross-section studies do have some credibility in our field. And now I refer to some studies that I have carried out in <coughs> Berlin. Later on we will hear more about studies that were carried out in Scandinavia. This is a result of a case control studies for, where for, for over two years time we, we uh, collected all uh, myocardial infarction cases uh, that showed up in, in hospitals in Berlin, matched them with control subjects that were treated uh, at the same time but for uh, diseases not related uh, to, to the noise and what we find here is an increase of the risk of myocardial infarction for subjects here for example in, that lived in areas where the noise level exceeded 65 dBA, an increase in risk of 25%. The lower threshold level, 60 dBA, is pretty low, but this is due to the reason that the noise maps that were available at that time didn't go any further. Interesting here is, and this is what we would expect, uh, uh, the longer the subjects lived in, 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 uh, in their homes, the risk increases. The, and this is what we mean that we won't get a heart attack from one day to another when we move into a noisy area. So this is, it increases the plausibility of the findings if uh, the risk is higher for subjects that lived for longer in, in the exposed areas. One thing we have to take into consideration is the shielding of houses. Um, the noise attenuation from the front to the rear side for noise is, is pretty high. Even in situations of detached houses, on the back side, here on the rear side, the noise level is, in dBA, <laughs> is diminished by, by, let's say, 20 dBA. And uh, here, this is summarized for what we, we can assume that from the front to the rear side, maybe a sound uh, attenuation of 20 dB. Closed windows also reduce the noise by at least 20 dBA. And in the Caffili and Speedwell studies, which was my first AP study which, where I was involved, we, we could sh show this quite nicely. Here you see the, the, uh, the, the relative risk of, uh, my, of ischemic heart disease in, in an extreme group comparison of subjects that lived in high noise exposed areas compared to low noise exposed areas. And if we consider only uh, the address as an indication of the exposure, well, the effect is neglected though. When we also consider the orientation of the rooms and the windows, the, this goes up. When we additionally uh, include uh, the window opening habits, whether they 
subjects kept the windows open when being in the room, and finally the, the residence time, then the risk increases uh, um, steadily. I was mentioning from, from the experimental work that sleep disturbance is a potential a pathway and also the WHO considers this as a major um, vehicle, how, how noise but during the night could affect the health. And we have some nice uh, results available that support this uh, idea. This is a study uh, also carried out in Berlin and to my knowledge the first or maybe even the only study where they compared the exposure of the living room during the daytime with the exposure of the bedroom during the nighttime, which is quite a difficult task because the bedrooms are normally located on a different side than the living room. And what we see here is, with respect to the exposure during the night, the, the effects were stronger and even significant in that study. Also in this uh, European aircraft noise study where Gerster was also uh, involved, uh, where we investigated the association between high blood pressure, hypertension and aircraft noise, we found that the slope, the increase of the risk of hypertension was stronger with respect to the exposure during the night than during the day. So sleep disturbance really seems to play an important role. And, and this one is a nice uh, uh, result from, from Austria. As similar as in the previous studies, they found that subjects that had the bedroom facing the main road were at higher risk for, for hypertension than those who had the bedroom on the, on the rear side. But with the distance to the road, in, in, in a far distance of a kilometer or so, this, this, there was no difference between those two groups any longer. And of course this makes sense because this, there is no sound attenuation from the front to the rear in such large distance any longer. So the noise level is the same on both sides. Okay, this may be uh, the most important part with respect to, to, to risk assessment, consistently exposure response curves. In decision making, we pro wouldn't rely probably on the result of just one or two studies. We want to, to, to have a, 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 an, an aggregated view of, of study results. And this is normally done in meta-analysis where the results from different studies are, are somewhere pooled. Here on the left side, you see uh, the results of studies that looked at the relationship between road traffic noise and high blood pressure. All these dots represent relative risks. Here are the studies, and the shift of these dots to the right uh, indicate an increase in, in the risk of hypertension in noise exposed subjects. And you, of course, different studies don't show similar results, but there is a consistency towards higher noise levels. With respect to the association bit air, between aircraft noise and hypertension, there is also, uh, here's five studies, and a shift towards a higher risk in a higher noise exposed group, and this uh, curve refers to uh, the association between road traffic noise and myocardial infarction. Also, uh, the studies show a consistent um, increase. And if we want to formulate this in numbers that can be used for quantitative risk assessment, then these are the results. And, and these curves are currently used for quantitative risk assessment by WHO and other bodies. So with respect to hypertension, based on 24 studies, we can say that there is a 7% increase per 10 dBA within a range of 45 to 75, or if you want to, uh, to express this in, as an extreme group comparison, then it's times 3, 7%. So the risk for the high noise group is within the range of increase, is within the range of 20 to 30% based on, on this meta-analysis. Five studies, myocardial infarction, a 17% increase per 10 dB, but the lower um, threshold here is just below 60 dBA. So again, for the extreme group comparison, we're dealing with 20 to 30% increase in risk for the high noise group. I just mentioned the stroke study for completion, but Mette will tell us more about it later on. Here is a similar data for the association with aircraft noise. Hypertension, myocardial infarction, you find a 30% increase in risk per 10 dBA. Um, 10 dBA increase of aircraft noise within the range of just below 50 to 70 dBA or so. And there's only one study available that was looking at myocardial infarction and, uh, and 
um, aircraft noise, 7% increase per 10 dBA. So all these studies really show some consistent relationships. And then, uh, here I, I try to put them all together into one graph. So the different curves, road, aircraft, hypertension, myocardial infarction. And what we can see here is the high exposed group, let's say above 65 uh, decibel, they, they don't vary that much from one another. So, so the, we can say that these high exposed groups suffer from a, let's say, 20 to 40 percent increased risk of hypertension or ischemic heart disease or myocardial infarction or stroke, whatever endpoint we're looking at. And if we want to convert it to the night and if we apply the usual 10 dB difference, which may be justified for road traffic noise, then that means that the subject exposed to outdoor noise outside their dwellings during the night, more than 55 dB a runner, 20 to 40 percent uh, increased risk of cardiovascular diseases. However, on the bottom end, we quite see some differences based on, on the threshold level. And this has quite an important impact, which will, I will sh show later. <coughs> I should mention that in the meantime, there are some more studies available, which are not included in the meta-analysis that I've shown, uh, particularly the studies by Meta, we will hear about it later, but the results, okay, uh, are not that much different uh, from what the meta-analysis suggests, particularly when we look at the association between road traffic uh, noise and myocardial infarction. The meta-analysis suggests 17% increase per 10 dB, and other studies that came later, 15%, 12%, 13%, they were much in the same region, and for aircraft noise also. Okay, so far so good. Effect modifiers. There are some studies that suggest that the effects are not the same for all the age groups. The results are not really that consistent, but as a rule of the sum at the moment, we can say that with respect to age, uh, the middle age group, just below 60, between 40 and 60, may be the ones that react, react a little bit stronger. With respect to gender, it seems that males uh, show stronger reaction than females, particularly with respect to road traffic noise. It may be different with aircraft noise. There are some ideas that the other females might react stronger, but this could be a field of uh, further research in the future. Length of exposure, of course, is an effect monitor. I showed it. Pre-existing comorbidity, uh, people that are prone to develop these uh, diseases for a reason of course, react stronger when they are exposed to additional stressors, such as noise. Type of housing, yes, some, there's a study, or actually the INA study showing that subjects that live in apartments showed stronger effects than those that lived in single houses. This may have to do with home ownership. The people that have with home ownership and that have a nice house, they may have better coping uh, abilities to, 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 to cope with, with the noise. The, but this field of coping is not very much investigated in the in noise and research field so far. Okay, what, what are the challenges that we're facing in, in our cardiovascular noise research? And one is the noise assessment. In the early days, we carried out noise measurements right in front of the houses where the people lived and related this to to the health effects. Nowadays, we use modeled noise levels. Uh, we are all familiar with these colored uh, noise maps, which uh, uh, we are obliged to, to carry out according to the European Noise Directive. These models and, and, and the software programs are pretty well developed, and, and they have some advantages, because when we use them, uh, there is no interference with other so noise sources, which would be the case if we go there with a the sound level meter. And also, we calcul want to calculate long-term averages, yearly <coughs> averages, and not just momentary noise levels. Although, uh, with respect to uh, traffic noise, you, you can get pretty valid uh, figures if you go there three times a day at representative hours. That, that gives you a good idea about the long-term exposure. Now, <coughs> it raises, this calculation raises the problems of zero dB. I came along studies that 
really uh, 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 carried out those response relationship, uh, investigated those response relationship, uh, having zero dB on the bottom end. And it seems logic. If there is no railway line, if there is no airport, of course <coughs> the exposure to aircraft noise is zero. That makes sense. With roads, but people like me who, who used to run around with a sound level meter, we all know that there are background noise levels during the day in an urban area, not below 40, and during the night, maybe not below 30. So this raises some concern, and we have to make, uh, think how to deal with this. I personally think that for traffic noise, we should have a, a limit, 40 or 30. For other more singular noise levels, it's justified to use the zero dB, because one aircraft in the morning at five that wakes people up can cause quite some harmful effect. And if we express it in, in LEQ as an average noise level, then, then we may end up with, with five, four, or six dBA. So it makes sense to use these figures for, for those response relationships. But the problem with these END maps is uh, that the current maps refer, uh, consider only the primary uh, road network. In most cases, some, some communities have more experienced uh, maps. I mean, th this is what these maps look like. We have the major routes, and the smaller streets are not assessed. And, and also, very often, it's uh, free sound propagation. So th these maps sometimes uh, do not consider uh, the, the shielding of houses. Which means that we're dealing with a certain amount of exposure misclassification in, in our studies. Here, here's an example, for example, for the city of Augsburg. This is the END map, which has been reported to the EU. And if we compare, for example, uh, the result uh, for, for a busy road here and a, a, a smaller street there uh, with an, another map that's available for Augsburg, which is much more detailed, where they assess the traffic volume in this street and in this street, you can see how, how drastic uh, the difference in the results are. This END map is very appearing because it even provides noise levels all around the facade. But what it tells us that in the front, on the front side there is an LEQ of 45 and on the rear side 43, where the more experienced and detailed map to gives us totally different values, 62 in the front and, and sound attenuation, attenuation and 46 on the back. And how come? These figures do not refer to the noise exposure of this street. These figures refer to the noise exposure of that street. And this is what we have to have in mind when, when we want to use these maps in, for our health studies. And another challenge um, that we are dealing with in the recent years is air pollution. Um, the air pollution community, when, when they moved from respiratory effects to cardiovascular effects, where they also found association, that they claimed all, all the noise effects as being due to air pollutants because they were not aware of, of, of the model and of, of the history of noise research. And since then there is a little bit uh, of competition going on between air pollution and, and noise. Um, maybe it's not that much a problem really because when we look at the correlations for Roadside, of roadside measurements between noise and NO2, NO, black smoke and, and particles, then the correlations are low or just moderate. So maybe we, we don't have to be that worried in noise research that our results may be confounded by air pollution. And actually, the, the, the newer studies, five or six, that considered air pollution and noise in the other analysis and, and adjusted the noise effects for air pollution. They showed a small reduction in the effect of noise, but uh, only a small reduction. And similar, the same thing goes on for, for the effects of air pollution on the other hand side. Interesting here that traffic volume uh, is higher correlated with noise than with uh, NO2. This makes sense because NO2, the concentration in the street is very much dependent on meteorolo meteorology, the wind speed and, and the wind direction. Noise levels in urban distances are not affected by the wind. 
And here are results for the modeled air pollution, where the land use regression rules, where the background exposure and the exposure from the streets is taken into consideration, and the correlation co coefficients are even lower. Also interesting to see that the correlation between proximity to the road and the noise level is higher than for particles. I'm mentioning this because in the air pollution, in many air pollution studies, proximity to the road is considered as an indicator of the exposure to air pollutants. Now, it's much more an indicator of noise. And also this finding is interesting here. The correlation on the front side between NO2 and noise is not high, but on the rear side it is even less. And this uh, can be explained by the fact that the sound attenuation from the front to the rear side is high, but not uh, the attenuation of the exposure to particles, because the particles penetrate to the rear side. And this, on the other hand, gives us an idea how we can disentangle these effects these effects in research. For, if, when we compare a situation like this, where we may have low noise levels at the rear side, but re still reasonably high exposure to particles, uh, with a situation like this, where subjects on, on, the, on the front and the rear side, regardless of where they do have their bedroom, uh, are similarly exposed to both exposures. Also, the air pollution maps uh, are very crude. Of course, the grid size, if it's half a kilometer a col col or a kilometer, within these grids, we do have the whole range of noise levels, small streets and big streets. So if we compare then noise with air pollution, we can say that noise is on a very small assessment, is being carried on a very small scale, while air pollution is on a much more broader spatial uh, scale. Obstacles are much more effective for noise than for air pollutants. We do have very well-defined propagation rules for noise, independent of meteorology, this is important, because the day-to-day -day variations that are found in, in air pollution epidemiology, they are not due to a change of traffic, they are due to the change of the weather. There is no accumulation of air pollutant, uh, of noise, in, in, in the atmosphere. If there are no cars, then there is no noise, but there is always a kind of an equilibrium of air pollutants. Okay, and proximity to the road is not exclusively an indicator of air pollution, but uh, even better one of noise. So, to summarize, we have a solid basis on which the reasoning is based in, in, in noise epidemiology. We started in the 50s with laboratory experiments, carried out animal experiments, in the later years, have occupational epidemiology available where we assess the, the effects of high noise levels, move to environmental epidemiology where the noise levels are lower, and since uh, 2000 or so, we are able to carry out quantitative risk assessment, which is important for policy making, and, and now we are in a phase where we are, where we are investigating the combined effects of, of uh, noise and other agents such as air pollution. The evidence is based on the laboratory experiment where we looked at the acute effects at high and moderate noise levels in humans. We assess the long-term effects at high noise levels in animals and have uh, occupational epidemiology available where we were looking at the long-term effects at high noise levels and from uh, environmental epidemiology we know that even at ambient noise levels uh, such cardiovascular effects Appear. We have a, a solid uh, model, a conscious and a non-conscious pathway, and so I'm quite confident uh, to, to express this statement. The question nowadays is no longer whether community noise causes adverse health effects, particular cardiovascular effects, it's rather to what extent. And this has to do with the slope of the dose-response relationship and with the onset of the dose-response relationship, the threshold levels. And my final slide then refers to this uh, threshold level. Um, or maybe I come back to that later. Don't look at all the figures. I, I was only comparing the current uh, exposure response curve used by WHO for the assessment of myocardial infarction due to traffic noise, where we found a 17% increase to 10 dB, with another scenario where we consider a lower increase per 10 dB, but starting at a lower noise level. And the 
result of this is that in the high noise groups, the attributable risk does not differ that much, 20 to 30 percent, but over the whole range of noise levels, the amount, the attributable risk percentage doubles if we consider also noise effects at lower noise levels below 60 dB. So this has a, an, an important impact on, on our risk assessment. And um, going back to this, these are the research needs then that we have to uh, refine our exposure response curve, particularly with respect to the threshold of effect levels. We may be interested in age gender differences, but not so much from the perspective of causality or reasoning, more from the perspective of, of risk assessment. Maybe the females are uh, less at risk than the males. We certainly have to improve our uh, exposure assessment, include the quiet side, assess other exposure modifiers, and look at um, day-night differences and have to clarify the role of air pollutants. And I think I should uh, finish here. Uh, we know, based on, on, on the first uh, round of noise mapping in Europe, that low traffic noise is the most important problem. 15% of the population may be exposed to noise levels of more than 65. And nearly half of the population to noise levels of 55. And if we apply our, the new, uh, our new dose uh, response curve starting at lower levels, then this would be the population at risk, a much more higher number. So I want to, would like to refer to these important documents, which you may be familiar with. And then finally, thank you very much for your attention.